Kia ora, Dominica. Tēnā koe. Kia ora, kia koe. Now, I'm just having a flashback. You were a Ducks at Te Aute College. What did you learn from that school? What I learned from Te Aute College? Uh, one of the things that I learned from Te Aute College is to be proud of our uh, tupuna and our ancestors and the people that went to our college, many of whom are adorned on the walls today. There's Te Rangi Hiro over there. And mm. That's beautiful, Perona, isn't it? Maui Pomare and others. This is a tough place. Well, I'm very well supported by my wahine, Ariana, and our tamariki, and that is uh, fundamental for me. It's a waste of time me talking about whānau and whānau order if my own whānau isn't strong, and that's very important to me. I'm very privileged to be here, not only through the support of the hard-working people of Hamilton West, but also my aunties and uncles from places like Rata and Raitahi and Akiteo and Opanake. Do they get in your ear? Um, constantly, and that's important because I need to be held accountable not only to the people of Hamilton West, but to uh, Māori, Fano, Hapu, Iwi throughout the motu. You gained a law degree in the mid-90s. What did you learn about Te Tiriti when you were studying law? Well, the same premise that I maintain today is that Te Tiriti or Waitangi, the Treaty of Waitangi, is the foundation document for our country. Now, with um, Te Reo, Te Pane Kiritanga, yes. your graduate. So yes. obviously, Te Reo is, you're passionate about that. Very passionate. Okay, how did you handle Tā Timoti, Tana Kōrero, i Rungi Te Pawaka Whakato, Te Karere? Well, I absolutely love and adore Tā Timoti and our other uh, kaioko, uh, toiho at the time, being Sir Pau, Te Mara and Wharehuia. And they, amongst many others, uh, inculcated in me a sense that without Te Reo Māori, the we as a people uh, were probably lost. Uh, so they're asking you to step up now when there's, the, the reo has been under, under, I guess, onslaught. A lot of people are feeling like it's in danger in the public sector. So what are you doing to combat that? Uh, te reo Māori is part of the country's DNA, past, present and future. It's an absolute taonga and I'll continue to maintain that. At a very personal level, I'll continue to speak te reo Māori uh, ao pō, pō ao, in the morning and night and all, all the way through. Uh, whether or not it's in Te Whare Paremata here in the House of Representatives and Parliament or elsewhere at an organisational level, I'll continue to advocate uh, for Te Reo Māori in Te Reo Māori and in Te Reo Pākehā. You're one year in Parliament now yes. and you have numerous portfolios, really significant ones, as well as being a Hamilton uh, electorate MP. So you've got uh, Māori development, Te yes. Arapiti, that's Māori Crown Relations, conservation, whānau order and social housing. Have you been given a hospital pass? No. No, it's a great privilege to be the uh, Member of Parliament for the hard-working people of Hamilton West and also to be part of Christopher Luxon's Cabinet and uh, to make sure that I can do the best that I can do uh, to promote the priorities within those portfolios, but also to be the best Māori I can be and be the best New Zealander I can be. And it's funny that to be the best New Zealander I can be I have to be the best Māori I can be. How much influence do you have, though? Well, that's probably something that you need to ask uh, other ministers. No, no, I'm going to ask you because, I mean, those are, that's a lot of work. If I look at all your portfolios, there's a Māori development layer in all those portfolios. Yes, so how much influence do you have on your other colleagues to say, now, getting rid of Māori wards, that's not conducive to Māori development. Yeah, no. Knocking back the smoke-free legislation, that's not good for Māori. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a fair and reasonable question to ask, but I think also that my advocacy, both um, privately with ministers, but also publicly in the press releases that I have and the mahi that I'm doing, uh, suggests that I, I do uh, voice the concerns, Some not, sometimes not always uh, a single concern, but the diverse con concerns of Māori communities and people like those who live in my electorate in Hamilton West. So I think it's building. Uh, my engagement with other ministers and with other agencies. What was the key message you took from Waitangi? The number one thing that I, uh, maybe a couple of things that I see uh, across those who is an absolute focus and appetite for Māori for kotahitanga uh, and the fabric of kotahitanga or unity to shine through uh, in, our, in our country, Aotearoa, New Zealand. And what that means is not everyone must be the same. Uh, but we all have our own diverse iwi, our own diverse communities, our own diverse aspirations, but we can live within a kotahitanga fabric that's based on whakapapa and whanaungatanga foundations. So I went to those hui too. There was a lot of kotahitanga and was yes. mainly against the government. Yes, sure, and I think that's uh, an impression that many people will have. But there's an aspiration 
that our whanaunga, our whanau, our hapu, our iwi and hapori have for that kotahitanga to uh, encompass everybody in New Zealand. Yeah, I'm still trying to understand your point there because one of the big issues, of course, is the Treaty Principles Bill that's been championed by ACT. You were appointed a Treaty um, Settlement Negotiator, so you know about the Treaty. So do you end up having debates with David Seymour and saying, no, hang on, what you're attempting to do here is to redefine the principles and therefore redefine the Treaty? As I said earlier on, uh, the Treaty to Te Te Waitangi is foundational for our country. That's my view, and I think it's the view of many people, both mine. Is it the view of your party? Oh, I think it is, and if you review our constitution, you'll see that Te Tiri Te Waitangi, or the Treaty of Waitangi, is acknowledged as the founding documents of Aotearoa New Zealand. There's no risk whatsoever that that bill will go beyond that select committee? No, what, what I would say is that our Prime Minister has made several statements over the last couple of months uh, that a referendum would be very unhelpful, that we are supportive as the National Party for the bill to be drafted by uh, the ACT Party to be taken through to first reading in the select committee. Given your background and all you know, would that be a bottom line for you? I'm very uh, clear on my views on the place and space of Te Tiri Te Waitangi and the Treaty of Waitangi in our society, past, present and future, and I'm willing to have a very reasoned and uh, professional debate about that. I think people want to see a bit of mongrel. Mm. Have you got mongrel in you? Have you got enough mongrel in you to fight when people are saying, hey, Minister, we're not, we're not putting up with this. You heard, you heard Rahui Papa, you heard all Hone, everybody up at, at Waitangi. Have you got enough mongrel on you to fight against your own colleagues or your coalition partners? I think you'll find in my, uh, in my CV and in the experiences that I've had that I'm a very uh, results and outcome driven person. And there's uh, a time to be uh, a very strong advocate, like the lawyer that I was. There's the time to be a negotiator. There's time to be someone who's, and I have been, uh, a person in the kitchen. And uh, in terms of that debate around the treaty and a number of other debates, then I have to be um, very mindful that we work in a coalition agreement and be very, very respectful of those, uh, those uh, commitments and those agreements. Does ACT and New Zealand First hold the kawanatanga power in the government? No, no. Uh, what I would say is that we are in a coalition government and it's a little bit different from other governments in the past. More from the Minister after the break. Māori are feeling under attack on so many fronts. Now we've had the Treaty of Waitangi Principles Bill, the Māori wards, Oranga Tamariki changes, ditching Te Akawhai, all of the Smoke Free Act, talk of reopening drilling and mining. How is all that consistent with Māori development? So there are a number of outstanding settlements, including mine, people in Mōkai Pātia, but also Ngāpuhi and some other uh, areas around the country. Those matters are outstanding and they need to be resolved. And I took Minister Goldsmith uh, to uh, demonstrate the leadership that he has in order to negotiate and finalise some of those uh, settlement, uh, settlement outcomes. On the other side, we've got a lot of inequalities of opportunity and disproportionate stats that we often refer to, closing the gaps, uh, deficit, uh, deficits that many of our whanau are, uh, are, are suffering or going through, particularly in education, health and housing. And this government's very focused and ruthlessly uh, determined to help address some of those inequalities of opportunity, hence one of the reasons why I'm the Minister or Associate Minister of Housing. So some of the strategies and policies that are, have been developed over the last few years mm. to address inequities, yes. which acknowledge the systemic failure of the Crown for yes. years and years and years, are now being framed as oh, preferential treatment, separatist, divisive, racist. How do you deal with people in the Cabinet that are saying that? Well, I uh, often refer back to evidence and data-based solutions. We have a great example in Fano Order. Fano Order, led by uh, people such as Tariana Turia, Bill English and others uh, in the national-led uh, government supported by the Māori Party about 10 years ago. Fano Order, in my, in my view, was a by Māori, for Māori, for everyone initiative. Uh, and there's really strong evidence to demonstrate that there's excellent social return on investment from Fano Order Kopapa. That's something which I think can be 
um, used, engaged, intersected with the social investment aspirations that Minister Willis and others like myself share uh, to help drive a better way of doing things. And a lot of that comes through devolution or um, de decentralisation of some putia and some uh, less red tape to enable whānau and those agencies or those providers that are helping those whānau actually get on with their lives. I guess one of the major criticisms of, of this government yes. is that it does not value evidence or data or Māori leadership and expertise. So if we look at Te Aka Whaiora, many people were feeling very, very emotional yes. because there had been such a lot of work in there, such a from some of our best brains, Māori brains, and the next minute, it's all gone. Mm. Um, and that was based on data, based on evidence. I think that in terms of Te Aka Whaiora, which is a great example, uh, we campaigned on that as we campaigned on a lot of the matters that you described. And uh, we uh, reached a, a space where we could form a coalition government based on some of the commitments that we made in the campaign, but ultimately the coalition agreements. But I think you'll find that Dr Shane Letty uh, has been very judicious and focused on ensuring some of the, the putia or the resources uh, that sit within government are devolved to Iwi Māori Partnership Boards and others. Is uh, de devolution the same as rangatiratanga? I don't think that it's a complete overlap. I do think that there might be some intersections, but the tikanga through which uh, rangatiratanga emerges uh, is from a different value set or a different worldview to devolution. Any government can just turn the tap off at will. That, so that surely devolution is not tino rangatiratanga. Who determines how much resource and to whom and for what that resource goes to? Well, I think there's some pretty strong um, uh, communications and engagements between the government and a variety of Māori, iwi and others. For example, the National Iwi Chairs Forum about what projects uh, or what kaupapa should be prioritised in the engagement by government with uh, and trying to help deliver to Māori communities. And they landed on an idea to support and focus on supporting and enabling some housing prototypes to build houses in, in our communities. I think that's a great example and I continue to support those where they work. The Iwi Chairs Forum now, they pulled out of the National Anti-Racism Action Plan because they said references to institutional and colonial racism are being cut back. Mm. What does that tell you? I think that there are some people involved in the conversation around building the plan that have been uh, disturbed or uh, found it very uncomfortable to um, uh, to continue that conversation without an absolute focus on those matters which they've re which you've referred to and which they've referred to. Uh, but that's a matter that's in the uh, bailiwick of Minister Goldsmith uh, and I'll be getting an update uh, from him on that matter in the coming days. So were you consulted or did you fully back the decision around Māori wards? Uh, the Māori wards uh, at all was very much a part of the coalition arrangements between New Zealand First and the National Party and also um, the ACT Party and the National Party. Uh, so there was uh, some very clear material in both of those coalition agreements around the direction of travel. Uh, yes, uh, the materials regarding the Māori wards has come through a variety of uh, portfolios that I've had and there's been a pretty robust discussion around that. Minister Brown, when he uh, announced it, he t one of the rationales was that he saw it as divisive. I mean, that kind of language I wouldn't expect from a national party. Yeah, I didn't minister. actually hear, hear the interview uh, with Minister Brown, but I do know that the coalition uh, arrangements and agreements uh, set out the pathway which we're going down now. It's kind of like the get out of jail card. Isn't it? For who? Well, for anyone in nationals to say, well, OK, well, we didn't really want that, but, you know, that's how you roll. No, I think um, what's important to us is that uh, com the communities in which the any wards sit have the ability to vote on whether or not there should be a ward. What I can say, and certainly in my experience, is that there's been a massive increase in Māori councillors throughout the country, and I absolutely acknowledge that. One of the things that people are really concerned about is the new fast track legislation, yes, yes. the bill. And that'll put a lot of power in the, in the hands of three ministers. And I see your faces popped up there, kind of a little bit muted. Inset. <laughs> I mean, have they, they mucked up the design or are you just kind of like a little bit care who are there? What happens when, say, there's a push for P 
permits and seabed mining. Yes. And Taranaki Iwi have been, you know, up in arms about that yes, for many yes, years. Yes, my people. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what happens there? Well, I think uh, what you'll find is that uh, over the last few years, a number of projects have really failed through RMA processes or conservation processes or other things. There's been a bit of bureaucratic molasses. Let's describe it that way. So Ruakura in uh, Hamilton East, uh, the great city of Kirikirero was a project that Taino Group Holdings, uh, uh, the holding company for Waikato Taino, was really pushing. And the council effectively said, well, hang on, hang on, hang on, that doesn't really suit uh, the RMA and our needs. And so Taino Group Holdings had to come to Wellington for three years, spend $3 million arguing for the Ruakura project to be put into the district plan. Now, that's a great example where essentially the vitocracy has taken over the bureaucratic molasses has made it harder for an iwi project to proceed. It is a lot of power to leave in the hands of a very small group of ministers. Yep. Where are the checks and balances? Where is the compulsion to have iwi at the board? No, at, no. On the panels or anything like that? They're yeah. going to handpick whoever. Well, uh, I think there's, there's a bit of water again to go under the bridge until we see the composition of the panels, but there are different stages and I expect that both the conservation as well as iwi Māori interests are given elevation in these processes. How much input have you had into this bill? I, I've, I've been involved in, uh, along with my office and the various um, agencies that are under my bailiwick, under my remit, in shaping and drafting and con uh, engaging on the appropriate wording for that bill. Mm. So you're feeling confident that that te tiriti rights and responsibilities of Māori and iwi apart from treaty settlements are not under threat? Well, I'm feeling very confident that there, are, there is a um, pathway, a runway, a space uh, for iwi to lead projects that seek consent and also be involved in projects as co-investors or maybe co-designers. That's a different thing though. No, no, I'm getting to that co-designers and also to participate in projects that we are not investing in or investing through but to have input to have engagement through those processes. We're back with the Minister of Māori Development after the break. <music> Beneficiary groups yes are saying that the cumulative impact of government policy is really having a negative impact. And there's cutting of public transport subsidies and the charging the benefit indexation so benefits will end up lower, holding down the minimum wage. When the government talks about getting people into work, how's that going to work when people can't afford to do basic things? Yeah, I think the first thing to acknowledge for me to acknowledge is a lot of people are doing it really hard in our communities and in society. Uh, particularly a lot of Māori people, so the numbers are pretty stark, 380,000 people on main benefits and 140,000 of them are Māori. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the level of deprivation, those are the ones that are on the benefits, there's also some that aren't, but are doing it really hard. And I really worry for those communities, many of, uh, many of whom live in places like Hamilton West, but also Northland when we went up to Waitangi earlier on this year and we saw people living in vans and in mm -hmm. cars out, at, uh, out towards the Hokianga Harbour. So I think there is a bit of work that we need to do and we also need to do um, and invest in uh, projects like uh, uh, the, the, the mahi at Okotiki around redeveloping farms and mussel farms and aquaculture and other things so we can create the employment. It was suggested that your target was to reduce 75% of people in emergency housing. Now how are you going to do that? Well, the first thing is we've got to recognise that the uh, the expansion of emergency housing to the state that it is in today and has been for the last couple of years is a social, cultural and moral disaster. At the moment, there's around 3,000 uh, uh, whānau adults and about 3,000 tamariki mm. in emergency housing, over half of which are Māori. And for me, that's not good enough for us as a government. And we have to take steps in order to not only uh, encourage people to and find opportunities for people to move into proper houses but also help people build houses to house those people. What's the deadline and how do you measure it? No, there is a date and it's articulated in the government targets announced yesterday which is 2030 uh, but I'm well, very... it's a long way away. It is a long way away. Beneficiaries are struggling so yeah. much and, and a lot has been um, exacerbated by 
government policy. Yeah, I think part of our uh, mojo or our intent is to really fire up social investments. And you would have heard uh, Minister Willis talking about social investment. You would have heard Bill English talking about it 10 years ago when he was the uh, Prime Minister and the Deputy Prime Minister. And making sure that social investment uh, is wrapped around scaffolded or supplemented by whānau order. That's the, uh, I think, a, a space where I think I can lend a lot of advocacy and support within government. There's talk of reviewing the history curriculum, okay. which, um, you know, there's been a lot of awesome people that have spent a lot of time and energy in creating it, a lot of expertise, a lot of Māori leadership there, and even outreach to students, mm. and that is all under review. Mm. Are you concerned about that? I'm not across the actual content and detail of that review. What I am focused on and have been uh, for many years is making sure that we understand that we have some transparency on what, happen what has happened in our history and history over time. I think that there's been some absolutely phenomenal and sensational work by those leaders that you described, but also by others who are doing this room and elsewhere to make sure that we never forget. And I really acknowledge those young people from Aotearoa College, uh, who several years ago mm. took that uh, mahi to parliament and brought that petition. Do you believe Māori ceded Tinoranga Tiratanga? No, we never ceded Tinoranga yeah. Tiratanga. That's why it's preserved up in Article 2, or Whutaturua, of the Treaty of Waitangi, and I know there's a lot of other documents as well that reinforce that sense of um, Tinoranga Tiratanga and also the movement that we talk about being Manamotuhake. How relevant is Te Tiriti now in 2024 when we are dealing with public sectors, when we're dealing with health, with justice, with education? Is it relevant? I think it's more relevant than any, than any time before because I think that we're in a position as a country to really uh, gather around the ultimate aka uh, matua of Te Tiriti o Waitangi, which is kotahitanga. That isn't uh, for um, just for Māori, but that's for everybody. Uh, but ultimately, Māori are fundamental to Te Tiriti, are fundamental to Aotearoa New Tirini, uh, is, was and will be. I know you've only been in here for five minutes, but when, you, when your kids, you know, come here for your valedictory speech, what do you want to say to them? I've tried to be the best Māori I can be and the best New Zealander I can be. And I can only be the best New Zealander I can be if I'm the best Māori I can be. And what does being Māori in this place look like? It's making sure that our, our identity is not only preserved, but it also evolves over time and that we are um, uh, uh, acknowledged or we are um, set as a fundamental part of the country's future. How do you fight for that? Well, I think people feel traumatised and people feel, feel vulnerable. And that for me is a message that I must be um, uh, uh, more, um, stru more, a more strong advocate and uh, uh, contributor to Māori success. It's been two years since we had our one and only conversation with the Prime Minister. Oh, right. Do you think you could put a word in for us with your boss? I've brought it all with his team. Thank you, Minister. Kia ora. Thanks for speaking with me. Māori ora. Kia koe. Kia tata. Tamapotaka. What a big job. Now, just before we go, a recent AUT survey measured people's trust in the media, and it came out last week. It showed trust is at an all-time low, revealed many people are consciously avoiding the news because they find it so overwhelmingly negative and depressing. I get that. Furthermore, they see the news as biased. I get that too, perhaps for different reasons. For generations, our mainstream media has been shaping public opinion about Māori and often doing a damaging, ill-informed and unprofessional job of it. In the last few years, however, there's been an awakening matched by a small but passionate Māori news media. This month, I'll be attending the graduation ceremony of Te Rito Journalism Cadets, mentored by Whakata Māori and mainstream media platforms. It feels like we've only just got our groove on, only now the wheels are falling off. Maybe it started when Trump and alternative facts 
hit our screens. It amped up during the pandemic and fired up in the lead up to our election. Misinformation, disinformation and downright lies openly peddled on social media. It's now a global problem. Yes, we're in a digital age. Anyone, anywhere, anytime can now broadcast their reckons directly to their fans, politicians included. Which is why, more than ever, we need fair, balanced and accurate journalism we can trust, holding the powerful to account while also being accountable themselves. We need professionals to tackle leaders, investigate corruption, reveal the truth, dig deeper, educate, inform, tell stories, celebrate, help connect the dots between community and the corridors of power. It's costly, time consuming and intense, but that's how it is. At the end of last year, the crack stuff circuit investigative team was disbanded. Last week, it was confirmed that around 350 jobs across the news media, including News Hub, TVNZ Sunday and Fair Go were gone. It's a loss, not only for those individuals who joined thousands of others now unemployed, but it's a blow to journalism and to New Zealanders who need to know what's going on in the world, even if it's inconvenient and we choose to zone out at times. Experts will analyse the reasons and hopefully come up with solutions. But for us here at Te Ao with Moana, to all those reporters and production crews involved, we send our solidarity and our aroha. Poor Marie.